Our next guest is a former Navy F-18 pilot who claims to have witnessed multiple unidentified aerial phenomena, a.k.a. UFOs. I don't know when we changed the terminology on that. Like I grew up, it was always UFOs. Now it's unidentified aerial phenomena. But he's not a random person. He is a he's works on R and D programs for DARPA for the Office of Naval Research. This is a legit person, and you know how I know you're legit, Ryan. You're a no. legit pilot because you got a cool nickname, Fobs. Fobs. <laughs> How'd you get that nickname? Uh, I got it the same way as everyone else uh, at a call sign review board. How does wait? How does, I know I'm not answering your question. I'm doing it. Uh, I'm answering clearly, but. Uh, it actually stands for uh, "full of Boston spirit." Oh, okay. oh, you're from Boston, <laughs> Fobs? That's right. Hey, me too. <laughs> Thanks, How you doing? Not Boston proper, but Massachusetts. Yeah, well, same. Same thing for yeah. Charlotte over yeah. there. Yeah. All right. There's yeah. a review board for this. Oh, it's, yeah, it's very official. We don't want to slip anything in that uh, might offend someone's grandmother on the side of the jet. What did you What did you do to earn the nickname "full of Boston spirit"? Um. Well. Uh, I don't want to get too too far down the rabbit hole, but let's let's just say that there were other options on the table, but they did not meet the qualification of being something you could tell to your grandmother. <laughs> I just I have him showing up just talking Red Sox all the damn time. Won't shut up about how Larry Bird is the best player ever. Uh, Tom Brady, Tom Brady, Tom Brady, a little bit more Tom Brady. Am I in the ballpark? I was watching. Um, I was watching when Bledsoe blew out his knee, and uh, and uh, oh. Brady went in, and I had the best high school years of my life watching football and watching them go all the way. It was just an incredible time, and never mind the Red Sox. So yeah, I've been. I grew up enjoying uh, the local sports. So so Ryan, you're you're in the news right now because of your congressional testimony about you know what you saw uh, when you were flying, and if we could for the video department, could we throw up? that clip of Ryan talking to Congress. These objects were staying completely stationary in category four hurricane winds. These same objects would then accelerate to supersonic speeds, 1.1, 1.2 Mach, uh, and they would do so in very erratic and, and quick behaviors that we don't, I don't have an explanation for. So Ryan, I guess my first question to you would be, when you saw this, what was the reaction of all the people you were talking to either on radio or when you landed later? Yeah, when we first saw these objects, we didn't jump to any uh, conclusion that it was something bizarre. Uh, when we first actually detected them, we detected them on our radar systems, uh, and we thought they were radar error. And then we got close enough to see them with our cameras. And that's when we were certain there was something physical there, and we really had to respect it. But again, we didn't go to, to you know UFOs, UAP, or, or anything too wacky. We just thought perhaps it was some type of drone program, something classified that we weren't aware of. But over time up to then, we started to kind of gather more information as a squadron and started to see these more exotic behaviors. And when we left, you know, we essentially just stopped talking about it. Um, we didn't really have an answer and we weren't going to sit around talking about UFOs all day. So um, we really didn't have an answer for what they were. And frankly, we still don't know what they are. We, we call them UAPs. We sometimes call them UFOs, but we don't know what those objects are still. Ryan, why were you guys able to now find these unidentified flying phenomenons or whatever? Like, was it an upgrade in machinery? Did you guys uh, get something new that was, all right, this is going to show us different things? Like, what was, the, what was that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we have our primary tool is our, our radar system, and we were using the APG-73 radar, which is a, a pretty decent radar, but it's a, an older technology. Our particular jets in my squadron, not my squadron, but in the squadron I was in, VFA-11, uh, we happen to have a particular lot off the line of F-18s uh, that were plumbed essentially to upgrade the radar. Uh, not all of them were. And so when we came back from our deployment, they took out the older radars and put in the newer APG-79, which required different cooling and other mechanisms. Uh, and when we did that, it took about six months or so to upgrade every jet we had. But we'd fly with on one day with um, the newer radar, and we would see all these objects, and we didn't know what they were. And then we might fly with a different jet later that day that did not have the radar, uh, and we wouldn't see them anymore. And it was it was that simple. You picked it up on radar. Could you see it with your naked eye? So no, I personally was not able to see it with my naked eye. 
what we would do essentially to try to ID these is we would come to what we call a merge, which is a point where our radar uh, radar points merge into one contact. That's where the term comes from. Uh, and so we do this often. We come to merges uh, when we train to dogfight. Uh, typically, we'll come with almost 1,200 uh, miles of closure zipping by each other. And when we do that, we get a very good look at each other. We'll look at how we're condensing the air around the wings to see if they're going in a certain direction, to see if their energy state is low, see if their, their flaps or their ailerons are, are moving around, see if their weapon loadout, um, see what their weapon loadout is. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things we're looking at in this very small uh, window of time. And we do this all the time, uh, every day for periods of time sometimes. Uh, and so when that's the same tactics we would use to uh, go visually ID one of these, uh, except we would slow down to try to close that or to make that closure rate smaller and smaller so we could see more information. And so we would go about 200 miles an hour, at least this was my experience. We'd have it on our radar. We'd see it on our camera system. Um, our weapons would lock on to the objects. Uh, our IR missiles would lock on and give us what we call a screaming tone uh, in our headset. Uh, and then all that information is being pumped into our visor. And on my visor is a little display, which puts a little box around the object, the space in the sky where I should look to be able to see the object that all my sensors are telling me is there. And as we would go within 500 feet of these objects, um, looking up at it, trying to see it, um, couldn't see it. Uh, I turned back around and we'd see the object still there, perhaps at a different altitude, perhaps offset somewhat, but they would still be there. And, and that was that. Um, it wasn't until we almost hit one of the objects when we first actually visually ID'd it. Uh, and that was a strange incident because the air crew never had the object on their radar, uh, which was a slightly different scenario than my experience up to that point. Uh, and the object was also completely stationary at the, essentially the doorway to our working areas at a very specific point in altitude. And it went right between two jets, two F-18s, and they, they canceled the flight. The, the lead of the pilot saw it and he said, hey, I saw, I saw one of those damn things. Uh, it looked like a dark gray or a black cube inside of a clear sphere. Wait, how many times have you guys seen them? So we, we were loosely you know, having conversations about this in the, um, in the squadron, as far as people that like visually could idea as that particular shape at the time I knew of maybe, uh, 15 or 20 people. Um, we weren't necessarily going out and surveying all the various squadrons, but that was our squadron's experience. Uh, since then I've learned that this was a problem that all squadrons that upgraded their radars as one would expect were seeing these objects. Um, and not only did it happen within period of 2014 to 2015, um, I left in 2015, I thought the problem ended, but since then, I've come to learn that not only did it continue to happen, but it is still happening today. I had former students reach out to me that I instructed as a, as a pilot in the Navy, essentially the next generation of pilots that went out there and said, hey, I saw, I saw a dark, dark gray and black cube inside of a sphere as well. Call me back. Now, and that was in 2020, I believe. After you see an object like this, uh, do any of your higher ups come up with any other explanations to you? Are they offering anything that uh, can explain what you just saw? Uh, my experience at the time was no, there was no explanation. Um, they just, there was just no one knew. Uh, there was not an answer provided. Uh, it was essentially, you know, get back to work. Ryan, when you talk about category four winds and it's standing still going at one point, one to one point, to mock can you put that into like layman's terms for people that don't really understand the technology that you were watching and witnessing that we really don't have access to absolutely so think about sticking your hand out the window uh not that easy to keep it very still at 50 miles an hour when you're in the car um now take that 50 miles an hour and, and add that up to about 300 and, or excuse me 130 miles an hour uh, put your hand out the window and try to leave it absolutely perfectly stationary in those winds. That's what these objects were doing, uh, and they're doing it at high altitudes. Um, we we have a term when we're flying around the area uh, if it's very windy, and we'll say we're 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 fighting fighting to stay in the area, uh, and that's the literal terminology that this particular pilot report used to describe their effort to remain in the area. 
if you take a big turn in a jet and there's a very strong wind this way, if you don't time your turn well, it could push you four, five, six miles during that turn and actually push you out of the area. And so this F-18 is, quote, and I quote, fighting to stay in the area to try to get close to observe this object that is somehow stationary uh, at high altitudes and high winds. And he doesn't know, can't identify what it is. Is there any chance that this is, I mean, when you were watching this happen, were you thinking like, oh, these are aliens, like these are alien life forms? Because I feel like people quickly jump there. But have you, are there other explanations? Could it be some like crazy technology from other humans somewhere? Like, I, I feel like the the leap from here are these objects to we're being invaded by aliens gets made very quickly. And I wondered what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, I agree. It does get made uh, quickly, and I would say too quickly. Uh, it's it's uncomfortable to live in that area of uncertainty, especially on this topic. Uh, but frankly, that's where we need to live right now. We we can't make that jump because if we if we do, we're either going to ignore the topic, people are going to shut down to it, um, or you're going to start investigating in ways that don't make sense for the problem itself. And so you really have to approach it from a first principled approach and not add all that cultural baggage onto it. And it's a challenge. It's hard. And people do it, you know, they do it within a split second having a conversation. It's a defensive reaction, it seems. Ryan, uh, under a minute here, you had your testimony in Congress. What did you not get to say to Congress that you would have liked to say? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, honestly, I felt pretty satisfied being able to share what I shared. Um I think there are a lot of individual stories I could have sat down and shared with them and they would have loved to hear one after another, uh, but there just wasn't time for it. But that's part of the effort we're doing at safeaerospace.org and people can sign up there and show their support to Congress. His name is Ryan Graves. He's the executive director of the nonprofit Americans for Safe Aerospace. Check out the Merge podcast with Ryan Graves. Ryan, thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for having me.